It's a Wednesday, and uh, the program is uh, ready for your consumption. It's McCowan. It's Shannon on the program. Hello, John. How are you today? Good, Robert. Good. Did you get caught in the rain yesterday? No, I didn't, actually. I didn't. No? No, no, I just, uh, I dodged it. I dodged it everywhere I went, so. Well, I went to my um, new abode yesterday out in your neighborhood, and uh-huh. on the way back, uh, okay. went through a... Uh, a significant thunderstorm. It, it was oodles, a good one. Oodles of rain. Uh, but uh, the prospects for the rest of the uh, week are uh, not terrible. So let's hope things continue mm. in that direction. Holiday weekend. Uh, Bianca Andrescu is um, becoming a, a very curious case. Uh, this young woman who at age, I believe, 19, won the United States Open, who went on a run of... Um, I don't know if it was a year, but a significant run of success who looked like she might be the next superstar of women's tennis, who certainly appeared destined to be the best Canadian player um, historically that we've ever seen, has been stubbing her toe with great regularity. And that continued as she got crushed in round one at Wimbledon. Your thoughts? Well, I, what I would say uh, more than anything and, and more than losing in round one uh, was I, I, I still wonder how healthy she is. I, I still wonder how many injuries she really has. Here, here's a woman who um, y- you wonder if she pushed her, her, her body past a point where it should have been pushed. Uh, and she has constant injuries and pains. Uh, that now seem to recur almost annually, um, and uh, more than they annually, I think. Well, but I mean, they, they, uh, regularly. That's but I mean, they just yeah. seem everything just seems to pop up all the time, and and you, 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 there are times you wonder if the human body is can take a lot of this intense, not only not only activity on the court, but her her training regime, and does she push her body too far? in order to get back to that championship level? Well, her performances have been um, disappointing, to say the least, over the last little while, and it's starting to get uh, consistent. You know, you could make the argument, you know, or could have made the argument that some of these performances were a reflection of the fact that she's been injured, the fact that she hasn't played in a while, there's a little rust on her. But um, I'm not sure that that was the case at Wimbledon. I mean, I don't know about the injuries, but... She should have been ready uh, for that um, opening round match and um, a disappointment to start the summer season. Uh, baseball on the agenda today. Our uh, good pal, uh, John Paul Morosi, will uh, join us to chat. He's in Buffalo, Bob. Well, we'll talk to him about, about the Blue Jays, um, about the, the American League East in general and the somewhat surprising way things are evolving there. And um, some other baseball-related matters. Oh, or maybe some hockey stuff, too. Uh, Morosi, when we continue after these messages. It's McCowan, it's Shannon, and our pal J.P. Morosi joins us. And he joins us from Buffalo, New York, where you'll get your uh, probably first opportunity, I I would imagine, to see a major league game in a quote-unquote minor league city. Um, or have you seen one of these before? Well, Bob and John, good morning as always. I, I would say this. I have not seen a baseball game in Buffalo before. And I think I can now say that as of tonight, I will be able to say that I've been to 31 current major league stadiums in a 30 team league. So I feel pretty, pretty <laughs> grateful about that. Uh, but no, I'm excited about it. Uh, you know, Buffalo, I think the last time I worked an event here was the 2003 Frozen Four. Thomas wow. Vanek was then the star of the university. I was at that game too. Yeah, I was, that was I a was great there game. Too. Yeah, it was. It was a great game. Was. So uh, I, I, I really enjoyed being here. Of course, a great hockey town. I can see Canada from my hotel room. I'm excited about that. So okay, it's, Mrs. It's Palin. All right, Mrs. Palin. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but she could see Russia too. Um, Morosi can't attest to that accomplishment. Uh, you never saw the Oakland A's play in Vegas. I'm trying to think of other teams that have played in minor league uh, ballparks during the course of a regular season. Can you think of others? 
Well, I've been to uh, – I covered a series in Puerto Rico when the Cleveland Indians played there against the Twins a couple That's of years right. ago. So that was a special – alternate site location i've i've covered games in monterey mexico which was a special experience too um so I, i've i've done some of these unique neutral site locations fort bragg in north carolina i covered a game in cuba uh so it's it, these these are unique experiences that i uh when you're going to a place for the first time you, you kind of survey things around how's the park gonna play uh, I, I it was interesting just coming in late last night my flight was delayed so i i got here just as a lot of fans were filing out of the ballpark and it was just great to be able to see uh, the Jays playing in front of fans again and I realize it's not in Toronto but it, certainly I'm uh, I'm grateful that, that there are fans in the stands there for them and obviously they've got a a much better ballpark to play in than they did last year they've really Im improved upon a lot of the infrastructure here so it was unique that I guess it was 25 years ago there was a pretty dramatic renovation at this ballpark, Salem Field. Of course, it wasn't called Salem Field back then, but uh, it was done at the time where uh, Buffalo was Cleveland's AAA affiliate. And at the time, the farm director of the Cleveland Indians was Mark Shapiro. How about that? How about that? Um, I'm wondering if you, if you have a take on the impact of playing in a minor league stadium for major league players. We who watch on television – um, the it's imperceptible. You really can't tell that it's a, a minor league park. Um, uh, more so with Dunedin where there's 5,000 seats or whatever there are. Uh, but in Buffalo, you know, other than there's no or virtually no stands in the outfield, it looks like a major league ballpark for the most part. But from a player's perspective, is it do you think it's tangibly different? Is there any advantage to the Toronto Blue Jays in that they play their now regularly a very interesting question bob i would say a couple of things stand out number one you can try as much as you can and the jays have this year notably to adjust the lighting on a minor league stadium but there are some aspects of the way that lights work in a major league stadium how they sit on top of the decks of the stadium mm -hmm. how bright it gets for a night game that it's really hard to replicate the the brightness of a major league night game right. at a minor league stadium. And, and uh, I, I was thinking, I saw a minor league game earlier this year, uh, Spencer Torkelson's home debut for the West Michigan Whitecaps uh, back in Michigan. And I was there and, and you just, it's a gorgeous minor league stadium, but you are, you are reminded of just how the lights pick up the ball differently. And, and to some hitters, how there is a difference in brightness. That's just, that's a natural part of not having the, the lights at the, 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 the brightness level and just the sheer wattage and the number of them that you would have in a, at a major league ballpark. I think that's one big difference. The other one, and I was actually speaking with someone yesterday about this, is, is the wind. And not having an enclosed outfield changes the wind. And mm -hmm. sometimes you will actually, uh, uniquely here at Salem Field in Buffalo, and we'll see what the situation is tonight, you sometimes have the wind blowing in potentially off the water from one field and then out to the other. So it really creates a, a swirling effect because it doesn't have that infrastructure to block the, the wind out in the outfield. So I think that's going to be one of the unique things about being able to be here and report for our YouTube broadcast, uh, the Mariners and Blue Jays, is to be able to convey to, to the viewers what the wind is doing and, and how uniquely uh, – it's affecting the players on a particular night. Well, the, the the key phrase, because if you live in Western New York, you you grew up and you learned about the Bills and you learned about the Sabers, uh, and you learned about Lake Effect, and that is the magic phrase of everybody that lives in Western New York. What's the Lake Effect today? And you can in the particularly in the middle of winter, you can be five five minutes from downtown and it could be sunny, and you drive through downtown and you're in the middle of a blizzard because it's coming right off of Lake Erie. So that's, uh, that, and Lake Effect exists in the summertime, no matter what, you'll see the sure. storm coming and disappear in about three minutes. <laughs> so unique. And, and of course, as, as you both know, Buffalo has been mentioned in the past as a potential major league expansion site. Not as much recently, but back in the early 90s, mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, as preparing for this game, a couple of things I did, I, you know, I, I learned about some of the older stadiums in, in Buffalo, of course, the War Memorial Stadium where the natural was filmed, yeah. uh, which has now basically been changed into a high school 
stadium, uh, almost similar to what they did in San Francisco for Kizar Stadium, which is up there in uh, near where the UCSF Golden Gate Hospital Park. is. Golden right, Gate exactly. Park. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so that was one unique thing uh, about what the old War Memorial Stadium has become. And the other thing, and this was <laughs> a lot of fun, there was a video on YouTube that described um, back then it was called Pilot Field. Uh, mm-hmm. where, where now, of course, uh, the Bisons and, of course, the Jays are now playing, now called Salem Field, and how that field was able to be expanded to a major league facility and, and narrating this description of what a brilliant major league expansion candidate Buffalo would be was Larry King. And so Larry King is narrating this sizzle reel, as you would call it, of of Buffalo's Chamber of Commerce pitch in the early 90s to have their own major league stadium and, and team. And it was just a unique thing to watch. And But it's certainly, as, as you both know, um, tremendously supportive and, and passionate sports fans in this town. And I, I think in the midst of a tough circumstance, it, it's it's been a great place for the Jays to call home. Again, the uh, just another Buffalo quiz for you, John. Uh, they never called it, locals never called it War Memorial Stadium. The old they rock ca- pile. They called the it the old, the old rock pile. <laughs> where the bills played where, where where some of the greatest bills triumphs too not just uh, not just baseball but uh, the bills triumphs uh, in the early 60s with jack camp at quarterback so. one of the issues we haven't discussed at all um this blue jay team as young as it is uh plays the vast majority of its games and um will continue to do so t- at least temporarily on natural turf uh, and eventually, eventually, we assume, will come back to Toronto and play 81 of their games plus the Tampa games on an artificial surface. So they'll play uh, 55% of their games on artificial surface. And in the past, we've talked, Morosi, about the advantages that that may create now that there are so few artificial turf ballparks, the idiosyncrasies that the team can get accustomed to. Advantage, disadvantage um, for the uh, Toronto Blue Jays in as young as they are. A lot of these guys have played almost no games on artificial surfaces. Very good point. And, and Bob, obviously at some point in time, the transition will happen back uh, to Rogers Center. Perhaps uh, I think we can all hope uh, before the end of this season, but it's, it's a, it's a unique transition. It's a unique advantage for them to have. Uh, I, I do think that, perhaps with a younger team and I and I look at it there's two different ways there's number one which is how the turf plays and how the hops play how it will affect your ability to field a ball uh, how it affects your base running decisions there are those aspects of it the other one is the toll it takes on your body and I think having a younger position player group will allow them to probably withstand the demands of playing on artificial surface once they get there and whether it's Bo, whether it's Biggio and, and Vlad obviously wants to play every day. And I think one of the things that it stands out to me about Vlad's season, the production, and certainly we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about him a lot about just what he has been able to put together. But a, a lot of what I've been impressed with, with Vlad this year is that he has continued to be in, in great baseball shape. And I think great baseball shape means something different for every player, but for Vlad, he's clearly found that, that good zone of, of fitness and ability to play every day and after of everything. A lot of, right. Well, exactly. Of everything. But through all the, through all the conversations that, that were surrounding Vlad after last season and conditioning, I just, I think it's important that he is continually affirmed and recognized for the positive changes he's made in his routines and his habits, because clearly they are still working and he's putting together one of the great seasons ever. You know, this week on MLB network, we had a graphic of the best years by a qualifying player in OPS plus who's 23 and younger. So OPS plus is it's a useful number because it's their on base plus slugging and it's, and it's attuned to the whatever's happening in the league at that time so it's adjusted for league and park factors uh your your production at ops and the graphic of the top six players ever 23 and younger who have done this at this level it is the the three of the pictures were in black and white three were in color the three in color were vlad tatis from this year and juan soto from last year 
and the three in black and white were Ty Cobb once and Ted Williams twice. That's it. <laughs> so again, when you're on a graphic and, and three of the photos are black and white and two of them are Ted Williams and one's, Ted, one's Ty Cobb, you're doing something right. And I think that's company. where, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, I think sometimes guys, we are, we're biased to the, you know, to the greats of the game from decades gone by. And, oh my gosh, how could anybody in these days ever equal or surpass them? They're doing it. Both Tatis and Vlad are doing it. And it's pretty remarkable to be able to say that here comes Vlad and he's got a chance. Now, if, if Otani ever stops hitting home runs, Vlad has a chance to, to win the triple crown. And it's pretty amazing to be able to say that here halfway through the season. All right. So here's a question that nobody's probably asked yet. Would you trade Guerrero for Tatis? Forget position. I, I would not. If it, if it were offered to me right now, straight up, I would not. I actually do have some concerns about Tatis's defense. And I really look at, I, to me, and I covered Miguel Cabrera for a long time in Detroit. They remind me so much of each other. The swing and the balance, the ability to hit to all fields. Vlad is a generational hitter. He has that ability to, to absolutely hit, hit the ball with authority anywhere he wants to hit it. And so Tatis, great as well. And, and if, if Tatis were an elite defender, I would, I would probably say that you'd have to make that trade if you were the Jays. But in this case, I, I think uh, hypothetically, that's a great question, Bob. Hypothetically, I would, I would not well, make that trade. Well, and I, I ask it in part because we are old enough, the three of us, to know the list of players the San Diego Padres have traded that were or went on to be Hall of Famers, extraordinary players, is almost endless. Um, I can't think of another team, JP, that that has had anywhere near the traded away anywhere near the number of great players as San Diego. Now, I don't think they're going to trade Tatis. And the notion of Tatis for Guerrero is ridiculous in, in and of itself. But that's sort of what rattled around in my brain. Speaking of trades, what did you make of yesterday's trade? Well, I think it helps the Jays address their bullpen. And, and while Corey Dickerson was the name that people might be most familiar with, I think Adam Simber is the name that's really making the, the biggest impact on the Jays. Simber, to me, really fits them nicely. He can fit to sixth inning or later he could close if he had to but he's really more like a seventh eighth inning guy unique arm angle sinker slider combination that works and it's a different look it's a different look for the bullpen and importantly john it's a, it's reliability and someone who's going to be there for a while he's under control for a few years yet so I, I think it really made a lot of sense to if you had to take on dickerson's contract to make it to make it work financially and and to make it worth worth the while of the marlins you do it because this is a team that I, I like. I like if I'm a Jays fan, I would like what's happened in the last week because you've got the Yankees with this crisis mode and, and seemingly without answers. And mm -hmm. the Jays are, are adding talent here. And, and that's, that's a nice, it's a nice feeling to have. If, if you're the Jays, you say, listen, my team's getting better. We're playing well already. And, and we're getting better. And we're starting to address the issues that have plagued us this year. And now you get Springer back. This is a fun team. It really is. I'm, I'm excited to watch them play in person this year and tonight because I really think that when you when you add in a lot of the different elements to this team, it's a fun group. It's a young group. They, love, they really enjoy playing. And if they get their pitching lined up, this could be a very, very fun second half of the season for the to, Blue Jays. To be the devil's advocate, though, doesn't it exacerbate or, or return the question of third base again to what could be an issue? I mean, because that's sure. one, that's one of the reasons why Ponick ended up playing so much was because they didn't have anybody better. Right. And obviously Espinal has gotten some starts over there and, and we'll see. I, I think one thing to point out is that perhaps as the, as the Jays improve internally, are they able to move some different pieces around? Could you, um, and we'll see what happens at the middle infield coming up. For example, do they, do they at some point in time, trade for a, a shorter term shortstop and then Bo plays third. Mm. That's a possibility. I, I do think that especially with a team that, that is clearly invested in winning this year, Semyon's on a one-year deal. 
you probably have a measure of, of creativity to adjust your, your alignment as needed. And I think Bo was already on record as, as saying, hey, what makes the team better, I'll do. And I think it's great. It reflects very well on Bo that he would say that. And so if that means you either call up, you know, does do one of the younger uh, infielders like a Jordan Groshans, do they become a call-up candidate at some point in time this season? Perhaps to play somewhere. And then maybe you shuffle the, the existing group there with, with Bo and Semi. And you've got some flexibility there. So, yes, I, I think, John, to your point, it remains a concern. It is still a concern. But I tend to think the third base situation for this team may well look a lot different uh, on on August 1 than it does on July 1. Well, I can't argue that. But if you don't play Biggio at third, you're rarely going to play him. But that's the one spot he can play. That's the one spot he can play. Because well, the, uh, the problem is you got, you got three everyday outfielders, actually four everyday outfielders. And, and Biggio isn't going to get much time in right field. They call Davis back up. Now, I think that's, I think we all think that's just a temporary thing. But Biggio isn't going to get an ABs unless you play him at third base. Five, five everyday outfielders, if you include Dickerson when he gets off the, the list. Well, that's an excellent, in essence, six. And I mean, and I think JP um, eloquently stated the truth. And that was that Dickerson's contract was one that they had to bite. And, um, Frankly, do you see him playing on any kind of regular basis with the Toronto Blue Jays when he's healthy? He could. I mean, th- this is obviously a very right-handed lineup. Uh, and so to mix in a, a lefty bat is is helpful. It gives better balance. Sure. Do- does he have some DH days? How does that fit in with, obviously, production they've seen from Telez during the course of the year? There's There's a lot of different things to weigh out. But I think in general – to add a veteran lefty bat who Charlie Montoyo knows from his time with the Rays, it's, he, he fits. I think to, to what we've already discussed, they, they were not going to go out and get Dickerson all by himself. Mm-hmm. This had to be part of a larger deal that made their bullpen better. And, and they also expect that uh, with Barucki coming back, that they believe that the bullpen will get better. So it's, it's an interesting time right now. And I, and I think that, John and Bob, you're exactly right about Biggio's role. I mean, third base right now has to be the spot that he forces his way into the lineup because if he yeah. can't do it there, he can't do it anywhere, uh, to, to borrow the saying. And, and I think that with with the way that the rest of the infield looks, uh, you're pretty well fixed in with, with, with Vlad and with Semyon and Bichette. So that's that's the one spot. As the outfield gets more crowded, that's the one spot that Cavan can hopefully carve out a niche for himself here going forward. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back with more. J.P. Morosi is with us. Back after these messages. It's McCowan and Shannon. It's Morosi, uh, who joins us from uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, you are um, involved in the uh, broadcast tonight, the YouTube broadcast, yes? Yes, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun format. It's going to be a, uh, a, a StatCast-themed uh, YouTube broadcast tonight. Uh, I think we have four people in studio, Brian Kenny, Sarah Langs, Ryan Roland Smith, and Mark DeRosa. They'll be there and I'll be uh, our presence on the site here to help uh, tell some stories locally. So it's, it's a fun, it's really a fun role. I, I've enjoyed my travels this year, getting back to the ballpark and, and uh, being able to contribute some of my observations from the, from the stadium itself. Um, of course, I have watched this baseball team, this Toronto Blue Jays team since day one. And, um, uh, you know, you got two World Series back to back. You've got the 15 and 16 teams uh, that were obviously very good. Um, and you can go back to the 93 season, I guess, 92, 93 seasons, and look at the lineup that the Blue Jays were able to put out there. That was pretty impressive. I'm just not sure I've ever seen a Blue Jay team that is this impressive offensively from top to bottom there are no holes in this lineup right now not a single one and i'm not sure i mean is there a better lineup in baseball today than this one it's a great question bob i i don't see one that's clearly better especially now and, and when you consider the absences of, over the year of, of hernandez and, and most notably springer and when they're all together now it's it's something to behold. It really is. And, and Vlad, of course, makes it all sing. I, sure. I, I wonder too, guys, and, and again, he might win the Triple Crown this year, but we could say potentially halfway through, is this the best first half ever by a Blue Jay hitter? 
It might be. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it is, it is something extraordinary what he has done. And you think about all the great players the Jays have had. I'm not sure anybody has ever been better over the first half than what we're seeing from Vlad right now. It's, it's a pretty historic level of production. Well, you did have that one occasion where you, that one year where you had the top three hitters in baseball average wise, were all blue Jays, Mm -hmm. but their dominance was not like this. They didn't have the home run power. They could all hit home runs. But it was Molitor, uh, Alomar, and Olerud, I guess, were the top three. None of them had this. I mean, this guy guy has a chance to be all world. Maybe he is already. I don't know. Well, I I think he is. And and the the interesting thing, too, is you consider where we're at offensively in the game. And this is where there are a lot of different conversations around baseball right now. Obviously, the the sticky substances and other things that are that are of concern. But when you look at the this young superstars in this league right now and what Otani is doing with the angels, what Vlad is doing here, what Tatis is doing with the Padres, what Acuna does with the Braves. I mean, that's, those are four in their prime young superstars that when you consider what they're all doing, you know, while the game has some things that, that has to work through from a fundamental standpoint, there's a lot to like. There's a lot to like about baseball right now. And I, I think the game, the, the MLB, in a lot of ways, is doing a very good job of marketing these young stars. Otani's doing the home run derby. The, mm-hmm. the, the, the video reveal of his participation was really cleverly done. This is, it's there for you every night. If, if you want to love baseball, if you want to love baseball, there are reasons for you to watch every single night I and, and i think it's it's a lot of fun to to just watch the game unfold in, in that regard the, the, the interesting thing is when, when you talk about that and you talk about the young stars of the game where, where do you think the audience is where, where where do you think the the crowds are where do you think viewership is um you know the, I, I think there's a public perception that baseball is an old man's sport to watch how do and and I, I I'm just saying that I'm, I'm making a generalization for the conversation. Do you see young people coming back to this game? Do you see kids coming back to this game like like they have migrated to basketball and like everybody's gone to the National Football League? Do you see a major league baseball coming back and reinventing itself for a younger audience? I do. I, I really do. And actually, some of the viewership numbers in the first part of the season, especially those via the MLB app. Uh, other other different methods of being able to watch games, whether it's online, MLB.tv. The, there's a lot of there's a lot of different avenues that that young people are able to, to now consume the sport. And certainly, I I, I get a lot of uh, Twitter alerts and, and different text alerts during the course of the day from MLB that that are that you know I'm I'm speaking as an older millennial, I suppose. I mean, I'm mm. almost forty now, but the the um, there, there are a lot of things that baseball is doing to meet young fans where they are and make the game more accessible. I also think you look around at, at the, the international scope of the game and, and the Angels, when you think about how, how time works, those games are in the morning in Japan. And, and when you consider that right now, arguably just the most, the greatest phenomenon, like Vlad is probably the greatest hitter right now but the greatest phenomenon in baseball is Otani with what sure. he's doing. And so his games now are, are in the late morning in, in Japan where people are awake and able to watch them. And you look at stars and their Twitter followings. It's pretty amazing. You look at like what Mike Trout's Twitter following is and it's, and it's big, but players that rival Trout include you Darvish. You Darvish basically has as many Twitter followers, perhaps even more than Trout does. And part of it is, is his, his following is global. And we're mm. going to see at, at the Olympics this summer, uh, w- w- with baseball being front and center in, in Japan, and, and of course, the Japanese League and Korean League, they're both stopping their schedules to send their best players. We're going to see a high level of baseball there, and, and we're going to be reminded, watching, as they call them, Samurai Japan, play in that tournament, wow, how important, how special baseball is there. And so I think as baseball is, is really adapting and growing internationally continually, it's a pretty special thing to watch unfold because a lot of the potential, there is, lot, there is potential here in North America, but there's also extraordinary potential 
globally to make the game even stronger than it is. You mentioned the sticky stuff, and um, that has been or was the topic of conversation last week. Um, that has waned a little bit, but I heard, um, I think it was Buck Martinez, but I'm not positive. It could have been Dan Schulman or Pat Tabler talking that, uh, saying that, in their opinion, this whole controversy is ridiculous. They ought to just get rid of it, let pitchers, you know, do the rosin suntan oil, you know, thing. Where are we going to go with this? Because um, what they have now is sort of a ridiculous system that does nothing but slow down the game. Not that we're paying that close attention to it anymore, but is, is this a forever thing? Or can you can't, if you're going to police it, you got to continue to police it, don't you? You can't just stop. Well, that's a very fair question, Bob. And the commissioner has been asked about this and he he did not give a firm answer on whether or not enforcement will change. He basically has said that it's going to be a dynamic situation. They're going to adjust to the circumstances as they exist. And part of the reason why they went to this in the first place was that they were noticing with spin rate, which is the a very, it's almost as though with spin rate that baseball has the ability to put a speedometer on every car all the time, where if, if things start getting out of the normal range, and all of a sudden you're able to drive from 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 Hamilton to, to Toronto in 15 minutes. Clearly something was a little different about how fast you were driving there. And and I think that's that's sort of the, the rationale here where baseball with the data they get in real time all the time, they could say, wait a minute, everybody's everybody's RPMs on their on their spin rate went as soon as we said we were going to move away from from examining pitchers every day, uh, their spin rate went off the charts again. Well, I guess we have to have more reinforcement because, uh, and more enforcement because we're seeing what's happening. So I, I think while it's, it's a difficult thing to enforce all the time, baseball with the spin rate and a lot of the, the statistical analyses, they have the tools at their disposal to make adjustments and, and to at times ramp up enforcement or let things go for a little bit. And I think at the end of the day, one of the important things is that in the month of June, spin rates have gone down and offense has gone up. So for all the controversy, and I realize the Hector Santiago suspension has been a big story in baseball this week. That's one suspension of more than 300 pitchers who have been checked basically in the yeah. last week or so. So one out of 300 is not a, is not an extraordinary problem. And clearly it's having the desired effects because more balls are being put in play. I'm well, just, I'm just me, concerned of the, uh, the, the, uh, the use of the challenge, you know, the, the watching Scherzer undo his belt, watching Romo undo his belt, drop his pants. I mean, all, all this stuff that, I mean, when, when uh, opposition managers use it as a tactic, I mean, that's, that's not kosher in my mind. Well, but it's entertaining, right. John. I mean, at the very least, um, uh, you know, it happened twice. Um, that I'm aware of, if it was happening every day in 14 different ballparks or 15 different ballparks, yeah, I'd say, okay, enough, enough. But um, I, I, I quite find, I find it quite interesting and, <laughs> and amusing to tell you the honest to goodness truth. But here, here's the point I wanted to make, JP. You know, and, and I'm not suggesting anything here. Um, there's all this kerfuffle about suntan oil and rosin. The rosin bag is sitting there. You know, it's legal. Um, you can put suntan oil on. It's just the combination of the two suddenly becomes an issue. Pine tar is legal for hitters. You want to get rid of, you think there's too many home runs in baseball? You think there's an advantage to hitters? Well, take, take the pine tar away. Let's see what happens then. And is there an inequity here that hitters are allowed to use pine tar? But pitchers can't combine suntan oil and uh, and rosin. That's an excellent point, and uh, I I do think that. And first of all, to back up a little bit, fielders have used pine tar on their gloves as well for sure. quite a long time as well. So that that's that's one other dynamic where the, where it has been part of the game. I, I think this that that is there is there a is there a an inequity as you point out? I suppose on some level, yes. Uh, but also the, the 
ramifications or the possible downside of of enforcement on the offensive side right it does help the the hitters get a better grip on the bat which results in them less frequently losing a grip on it and tossing it inadvertently into the stands that's one thing uh i I also think that it that we're at a time where the pitchers are so advantaged that giving the hitters the advantage of being able to grip the bat with pine tar is is acceptable in the minds of of and we're trying to sell offense people and right, we're trying exactly. to sell over it. Exactly. That's I, I think to John's point, Bob, this is baseball is doing this not because they all of a sudden got their conscience about about what is fair or not fair to use on the mound. This is happening because of the incredible strikeout rate and of course, and, and the lack of the lack of what people in the game see as fair play for the pitchers and and again this would have been permitted if pitchers by and large had remained on the same trajectory that they'd had for a long time what happened differently here was the spider tack and the super the super violations of the rules way above board about about using these foreign substances to get not just like a little bit more of a grip but an unfair grip. And so mm-hmm. to John's point, Bob, I think this is now just balancing out something that baseball has been trying to do. And let's be honest, while there were a couple bizarre moments on the field, again, that's two of those, one suspension out of, you, you take, you, just, I'm just using rough numbers here, 10 pitchers, let's say, give or take, maybe more than that, have got in the games per team. There's 30 teams. So 300 guys have been, examine evaluate in the last week or so and those were three cases where it was something that was worth reporting here that was that stood out one way or the other and that's one percent of the time so that, i mean that's a pretty uh pretty good ratio of guys that have made adjustments and follow the rules well look at from my perspective i i think they're they're and this is what baseball has done uh, for decades sent more than a century is there are certain things that are considered by the sport to be acceptable and other things that aren't. And that changes from time to time. We are now going through a period or have been going through a period where everybody, every major league pitcher throws 95, most of them throw 97. um, And hitters are being paid for hitting home runs and bulking up. And so we went through the steroid thing, both for pitchers and hitters, but more for hitters. Um, And now we're talking about there's too many strikeouts, so therefore we're going to punish the, the pitchers. In, you know, I make, I'm going to make the argument, as I have all along, that if you, if you continue to reward hitters for hitting home runs financially, then hitters are going to learn to hit home runs. If you continue to subscribe to the theory that MPH on a fastball is the most important factor in determining whether a pitcher is going to make it to the major leagues, they'll continue to do whatever's necessary to throw harder. They're just perpetuating the same kind of thing um, rather than dealing with the problem directly. And um, I don't know. It's just, it just seems like a, a, a bass backwards way of, of conducting business. But baseball's done this all along. They've, do, they've done it since the beginning of time. And, there and have, yeah, you're right. There have been different eras, Bob. There have been different uh, and, and different causes, let's say, of, of what the game and what teams have valued. There's no question, and this is the other part of this conversation, which is we're finding out now in real time how much of the the offensive approach, very much oriented to power, as you're describing, Bob, is because the hitters believe that's what they have to do to get paid versus that's what they believe they have to do to make Well, it's not believe, JP. It's not believe. It's reality. They do. Right. Well, well, but here's the, here's the corollary is this. One of the reasons why hitters believe they have to hit for power now, to your point, is because they're being rewarded for it financially. But also the shifting that's happening in the game is, is making it such that a hitter says, okay, if I'm hitting the ball on the ground or even a line drive where I used to normally hit it for a base hit, there's now three defensive players right there and so the one place I know for sure that I can put the ball and not be caught by a defensive player is in the stands. 
And so that's part of the reason why we're seeing offensive players take that approach because they know that's, that, that if they hit it over there, they're not, they're not going to be out. And, and, I, and I think that's where the, the illegal defense idea that's been mentioned at the, at the minor league level, I do think, Bob and John, uh, there might be some steam behind that going forward. And if you can take in concert, pitchers not being able to use as much sticky stuff and offensive players having more green to aim at if, there, if there's only two infielders, for example, on each side of second base, I think that that is a collaborative, comprehensive way to address what's been the issues offensively in the game. No, no, you see, you, you know, you're buying into the baseball uh, philosophy here. Let's not, let's, let's address the problem in the exact ro- wrong way. The answer to the question is teach hitters to hit it the other way. Uh, and it, that that's no secret. And it isn't nuclear science. Um, Bichette is a perfect example of a guy who can hit home runs. I was, he got 15 or something, 16 already this year. I mean, it's not at the top, but, that's pretty good for a shortstop. John, how many times have we seen Bichette hit at the uh, to the opposite field, hit it to right field? Over and over and over and over again, he hits the ball the opposite in the opposite to the opposite field. Mm-hmm. Now he doesn't hit many home runs the opposite way. He tries to yank his home runs as most guys do, but he'll go the other way. Um, and eventually, I think teams are going to start to, you know, reverse pivot on him. But you know, Rod Carew, um, uh, oh, it was a long list of guys. That, Tony that, Gwynn. Tony Gwynn. That would look and see where you're playing and try and hit it the op- in the opposite direction. But, but, but the, aren't those guys exceptions rather than now. rules? Sorry? Aren't those guys exceptions rather than rules? I mean, they're the no, greatest. I don't think they're, so. They're the greatest hitters of, our, uh, of Major League Baseball because they could do that and not everybody could. Well, well I, I think... I, I, Okay, I, I would add quickly. I would add quickly that 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 there used to be even when I started covering baseball 15, 16 years ago, that you would see hitters take situational at bats, especially late. That's in right. Game. Count and outs d- dictated how they would approach an at bat, and now oh. you see much less variance in that approach. Mm. Well, when's the last time you saw a guy choke up on the bat? Now, okay, maybe that that isn't part of the teaching method now, but that used to happen all the time. We used to point out, you know, when he gets to two strikes, he'll choke up. Now, Biggio has that big, uh, or Brissette rather, has that big leg, front leg kick, left leg kick until he gets two strikes. And then he basically keeps his front foot on the ground and that gives him more control. So there are guys out there that still play the game. I think the way it was meant to be played but the game is not reacting properly, at least in my mind. Um, well, I'll, I'll make one quick point that we have seen, Bob and John, in recent years, teams that win the World Series, or at least make it there, often have contact-oriented lineups. You, you think about the Nationals. Howie Kendrick was one of the heroes of their run in 2019. Um, he is, and he is a contact guy. 2018, the Red Sox, they got there. Remember all that, that – great counter on how many of their runs have been driven in with two outs or even two outs and two strikes that approach wins. And and I really think guys, it's so interesting to me that we watch October baseball and during October, we all say, wow, look at the value of contact. Look at what this veteran hitter does. And then spring and play. (laughs) And then as soon as the off season rolls around, the GMs are building teams in totally different ways. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, well, I got one more topic that I wanted to address here, and that um, because we haven't talked about it much. In the American League East, the expectation was that Tampa Bay and the Yankees would be the cream of the crop, and maybe the Blue Jays would would battle for a wild card spot. Baltimore was going to be at the bottom, and Boston. Well, I don't know what Boston was. Guess what? Boston's in first place. Um, is this a magic act, or is there enough talent there to respect? that they are a good baseball team? Well, that's an excellent question, Bob. And there's a lot there with Boston. First of all, Alex Cora is a very, very good manager. Uh, he, he gets the best out of his players. And when you look around that club, J.D. Martinez bounced back after disappointing last year. Xander Bogarts, I think, is one of the best players in the game that we don't talk about enough. Tremendous, tremendous player. 
Rafael Devers has great potential and now is starting to realize that potential. Uh, Alex Verdugo, of course, whom they obtained in the Mookie Betts trade, is having a very, very strong season. So you start looking up at, at this lineup and how, how balanced they are. There's a lot to like there. And, and their rotation has, I think, overperformed what their expectations were. Oh, Getting yeah. back Eduardo Rodriguez was really important. So is it sustainable? I, I don't think they're necessarily the best team in that division when you when you look at the, the full six-month season, but they're playing very well. They've had good health with their rotation. Their bullpen was built, I think, very thoughtfully by High and Bloom as well. So I, I would still say, Bob and John, there's a better chance of a team other than Boston winning the division because I, I believe that if you added up the possibility of Tampa and then the Yankees making a run and, of course, the Blue Jays, I think that's all a little bit more than than 50%, but it's getting close where I think Boston, they've done this for a while now where it's not just a good start. They're a good team. And it's mm-hmm. the, the same is true for the Giants out West, by the way, in the National League with how well they have played relative well, to the Dodgers, shocking, Dodgers too, yeah. and the Padres. Yeah, that is quite shocking, especially in a division with two teams like, as you mentioned, San Diego and L.A., who, I mean, I think, I don't, did you think San Diego would contest L.A. this year? I thought LA was still probably going to be five to 10 games better than them when all was said and done, but that San Diego probably was going to be a wild card. Almost assuredly was going to be a wild card team. San Francisco's come from nowhere. You're right. And, and that's where to credit Farhan Zaidi and, and Scott Harris, their, uh, their president of baseball operations, and their GM for building their pitching staff the way they have so many one year deals, Kevin Gossman, Anthony DiSclefani, Alex Wood, all one year contracts. And so when you look around the industry, how hard it is to build a rotation when you have to do it through free agency and to do it effectively on one-year deals, my goodness, there I would say that collectively they are uh, front runners to be the executives of the year. Are you in uh, hockey withdrawal yet? Yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I miss it. Uh, I tell you what, guys, to be at the rink was special. And, and uh, I, I'm lucky that my job allows me to cover both sports that I love so much. And, and so to be – to be able to be back in Canada, obviously I was following the protocols when I was in Montreal, but to be in that building, as you both know, was just emotional, extraordinary, uh, great atmosphere, great. The, the fans there, as we know, are just incredible. So just everything about the experience and the emotion of being there and looking up at the banners and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then Vegas was, was great. So that was a lot of fun to be in that atmosphere. And, and uh, Petrangelo had just an amazing, amazing series. I thought, you know, he, obviously his team didn't win, but I don't know if anybody outside of, Carey Price was better in that series than Alex Petrangelo. No, you're not wrong. You no, know, do, do you think Montreal has a chance? No. Sure. Based on what I, you've I seen. Yeah, because it, it, here's the thing. They a couple things on that. Number one, they they lost they lost game one to Vegas in a very similar fashion to the way they lost game one of this series. But the one difference that I would say, and 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 why I probably see Bob shaking his head. I mean, nobody on Vegas is as good as Braden Point. No one. And, and I think that Braden Point is someone that that the Habs have not seen yet in these playoffs. And Braden and Point is, may not be the best Tampa Bay Lightning player. Right. There's, I mean, you could argue uh, – I mean, you could argue a couple others are, are right. right in that conversation. And, right. and by the way, you're seeing great play from – Sorelli's been fantastic. I mean, there, there's a lot of – even the guys that you're not necessarily looking at as, as all-stars perennially are, are playing great – for them. So I, I think overall there's, there's a lot to like about just the, the overall brand that they're playing right now in, in Tampa Bay. Oh, well, let me, let me tell you two, you two dummies exactly what's happening here. Um, Vegas's offensive output from its forwards uh, disappeared completely and they couldn't overcome that. If you think Tampa Bay's forwards are going to go to sleep, you, you got another thing coming. They are at a different level. Um, I mean, it, I think we underestimate how good this Tampa Bay team is. I, I mean, they're defending Stanley Cup champions, but I, I think we kind of take them for granted. But when you watch them night in and night out, boy, they are impressive. And Montreal Cinderella story has been fantastic, but it ends here. I took I took Tampa in five. When what did you, did, Shannon? Did you did you take uh, Montreal in seven? Six, I think. Six. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just honestly, I I don't see that with due respect, and there's nothing that happened in Game One uh, to change my mind. 
Um, I think Montreal has finally met a team that they can't beat. Well, and and plus their Tampa's goaltending is more consistent than what Vegas's goaltending sure. was. And sure. and and again, is it a different series if if Leonard starts Game Five? Maybe, maybe. I think Leonard of the two in that series was much more consistent than Fleury was, especially in the area of rebound control. But Vasilevsky and Price are probably in the class by themselves right now, and Vasilevsky is just an extraordinary goaltender he's just and and it, they have a very strong defensive front of them now the one thing that i would say from montreal's perspective is they did a very good job um and, and maybe in game two they're into the series a bit more if they are are a little more organized among their defensive core and adjust you know the, when you think about the veteran nature of their defensive core weber edmondson petrie Sherrod, especially that that group of four they'll adapt and Luke Richardson's done a very good job working with us with the defenseman overall. Obviously, again, the, the coaching staff has had challenges here in the last uh, several games without Dominic Ducharme, but I, I think there's, there's a lot to believe in with the Habs defensive acumen and their, the wisdom of their defensive core. I think they've got a chance to win this game too, and make this a, a much more competitive series. You know, I tell you what, to me, you talked about how good Alex Petrangelo was. Um, Victor Hebben's a better defenseman than Alex Paterno, uh, you know, and Ryan McDonough is really good too. Uh, and, and we saw what Eric Chernak did in game one of this series, you know, they, and, and they've got Sergachev doing what he's supposed to do. They, they really try to activate their defenseman. Tampa does. Uh, and I don't think other than Petrangelo, I don't think Montreal saw anything like this with the defenseman in the offensive zone moving the puck and, and effectively becoming a fourth forward, effectively becoming a fourth forward, and you and you and you're in in your own zone, you were outmanned every time, and that's why there were five goals. Uh, that that to me is the the biggest difference is how Tampa uses its defenseman right now, and and whether Montreal's top four guys, the guys you mentioned, by the time by the time we get to game two, how tired are they already? after the playoffs they've run because they've they've run them well and they run them hard for the first three rounds. And can those four guys keep it up? I, I guys, I, you know, in conclusion, I would say uh, do not undersell the notion that uh, the Tampa Bay lightning may be considered in the, in a year or two or three from now as among the great teams of, in the history of the national hockey league, if they keep this thing together and it doesn't seem to be any reason why they won't, they're really good. You know, we may be talking about them in the same breath as the Edmonton Oilers or the New York Islanders or the Montreal Canadiens or any of the, the well, intermittently the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, I think they're, I think they have every chance to be that good. The cap is the only thing that might kill them. The cap might kill them. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and don't, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget who built the foundation there. And, and where he is now. Oh, oh yes, there we go. The Michiganders <laughs> coming through. There he is. Uh, oh, there's a little, there's a be an ode to Stevie Y tonight on YouTube. You know, the question is can lightning actually hit the same spot twice? <laughs> oh, lightning. I didn't even think about that. Um, Morosi, you look beautiful. Um, uh, uh, glad you're uh, nearby. Sorry, you can't cross the border. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully see you soon enough. And uh, thank you, as always, for spending a few minutes with us today. We always, always appreciate it. Likewise, my friends. Always enjoy our conversations. And, and thanks for letting me get in some hockey thoughts. You, you know, that's uh, it's, uh, very special to me. So right. It's for, the uh, only reason we, you, 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 double, you could double <laughs> dip today. That's why we did it. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, guys. Always enjoy the conversation. Uh, have a great one. Thanks for having me. Go get some buffalo wings. <laughs> Uh, JP Morosi, we'll come back and wrap it after these messages. Well, we always go down uh, of a whole variety of roads with, um, with Morosi. Uh, we didn't discuss Ohio State, Michigan football. Thank goodness. But um, uh, that will come soon enough, as we have discovered, John. Like, the four, like the four seasons of, uh, of, uh, of, of the year, Ohio State, Michigan becomes a conversation with you and Morosi, so... Well, not necessarily at this time of year, but you know, you blink and then it's on, it's on you. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, the Canadian football league is about to, to yep. relaunch, uh, national football league training camps are not that far away. <laughs> you know, it's just, 
uh, the time goes by and um, and you're on to other subjects at other times. Well, it also feels it's shortened because both the NBA and the NHL are probably four weeks later than they normally would be too, right? So that that gap, if there is ever a gap between sports, is even that much shorter right now. Uh, very quickly, Doug Smith's going to join us tomorrow? Yes, Doug's in Victoria. We're going to talk about uh, Canada's basketball uh, journey to try to get to Tokyo and uh, maybe a little Raptor talk. Yeah, last night, um, Canada beat Greece, uh, not as dominantly as perhaps they would have wanted, but nonetheless a victory. They will play China tonight, which could have been, may still be, um, an obstacle, although the Chinese don't have many of their best players available for this. Um, so one down and what, three to go? Three. Three to go. You have to win four in order to get there. Mm-hmm. And there's there's no no options. You got to win them all. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll see whether Canada prevails uh, tonight and then talk to Doug Smith about it tomorrow. We hope mm-hmm. you'll join us for that. For Shannon McCowan, have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody.